My guest today is Liz Quain. Liz is a traveler, digital nomad, entrepreneur, and world schooling parent to her twin 14 year old girls. She is passionate about learning about other cultures, has traveled to nearly 50 countries, and lived in several of them. She and her twins have been traveling for most of the past seven years, visiting or living in 20 countries throughout the world. Through her Trailblazing Families 12-week group course, Liz helps parents learn how to travel and world school their children with knowledge, confidence, and ease so they can live the life of their dreams as thriving global citizens. I'm sold. Welcome, Liz. <laughs> Thank you, Neville. Thanks for having me here. It's so great to see you again. Yeah, likewise. This is a conversation I have wanted uh, to have for a while. It's not the first time we've spoken, but I've been dying to ask you a bunch of these questions. Let's start with just the most basic one. W what is world schooling? Um, sure. World schooling very quickly is using the world as your classroom. And um, it's going above and beyond going on a vacation or a holiday or staying at a resort. It's um, learning about the world, learning about the other cultures around the world. Maybe you might be learning other languages, meeting locals, um, you know, kind of how they do things, you know, their religions and customs and food and all of that. So it's going above and beyond being a tourist. And it's, it's a form of homeschooling. So homeschooling is... Uh, Typically, it's a very umbrella term, but it's typically when the parent is the teacher instead of um, the teacher is the teacher. And then we also have what some people call unschooling. I like to call it self-directed learning where the child chooses what to learn. And then world schooling is, again, the world is the teacher um, and the kids are just going out there in the world. And um, it's, it's a very nice organic way to learn. I mean, I know some parents will kind of combine homeschooling and world schooling where the parent will choose like we're going to Greece and we're going to learn X, Y, and Z and we have these online programs or books to go along with what we're learning. There's other families though who are unschoolers. They, they don't have anything academic prepared. They just go out there and travel and see things and immerse in the culture and see their kids like uh, get really excited about things and ask questions. And then, you know, what my girls, we, we kind of combine self-directed learning and world schooling as they would see things out in the world and then ask questions. And then we would go back to our Airbnbs or or wherever and look up a YouTube video or go on Wikipedia and, and kind of deep um, dive a little deeper. Um, and then other parents, again, they say, well, we're going to go to the P Panama Canal. So let's learn about it before we go there. So there's many different ways to do it. Um, I even think if you're world schooling on school breaks, that's still world schooling. Um, you could even world school from home and not really have to travel. I mean, of course, the best way is to travel, but you can um, just really try to learn about other cultures in your hometown or city, go to those international markets or those um, festivals, you know, different Scandinavia Day festivals or whatever. And um, so you can do that in your home country, but the best way to do it is get on a plane or a train or bus or something and go out there in the world. Um, also, some families will enroll their kids in local schools around the world, maybe to immerse into the uh, culture and the language a little bit more. There are bilingual schools too. And then um, some people will go to world school hubs. Um, those are popping up more and more. And some people will travel around the world and um, also be enrolled in an online school. So there's many, many different ways to do it. Also, I have hired nannies for my kids, not so much to babysit them or take care of them, a little of that, but to speak Spanish to them. And that um, was one of the ways we world schooled. So many different ways to do it. Wow. There are... So many uh, questions I have after that and, and YouTube videos I'm going to need to watch and, th and threads I want to pull on. I'm just putting myself in the shoes of, of uh, the people listening and watching this. And I, I, I know many of them, people who have uh, similar minds to my own and, and I'm sure yours are thinking that sounds amazing. I, I wish I knew about that option earlier, but I think some of them are also thinking like, oh God, that sounds awful. Um, I, I just want to go on vacation when I go on vacation, when I travel. And, I, and I'm curious because, because of your course and your experience, people who are interested in world schooling come to you. You're kind of like their first stop when they're, when they're starting on this journey. And I just wonder like, 
Why is it that families are choosing to world school their children instead of the traditional model? Like, is there a common denominator? What, what are the reasons they come to you? Well, I think some people turn to homeschooling, unschooling, world schooling, whatever you want to call it, because they are dissatisfied with the traditional school system. Um, it's it's quite antiquated in my view. It's about 200, one, 200 years old. Um, it was created uh, during the Industrial Revolution. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of schools are still teaching the same curriculum in a way and in a way that they have for the last 50 years. I mean, my, you know, kids, my, the uh, kids um, nowadays that are in school, they're still learning what I learned way back in the day. And, um, you know, now we have the internet, we have Google, we have ChatGPT, we have so many tools, so many ways to learn. And I don't think that the schools, I mean, a lot of people agree with me that um, the schools are not preparing them for the future. There's a big percentage of kids, even college graduates, that are not uh, prepared for the future. They don't have 21st century skills, uh, which typically are critical thinking skills, communication, creativity, and collaboration. And the school system is just, you know, still too much memorization and learning. And unfortunately, you know, 90% of what most kids are coerced to learn, they forget soon after the test. So I just, I just feel like, what's the use? So a lot of other um, families are disenchanted about this um, for academic reasons, not just cultural or religious reasons. I mean, people think that uh, all homeschoolers do it for religious reasons, but there's more and more families doing it for secular reasons. And um, so there's that. And, you know, more and more families are parents are able to work online. They're becoming remote workers and they're realizing, OK, we're homeschooling the kids and we're working at um, working at home and we can do this anywhere in the world. And so some people um, also have an adventurous spirit. They like traveling. Maybe they've gone to Mexico and Hawaii and these uh, short vacations and they want more. They want to go beyond the resort and and kind of immerse more in the local culture. And, you know, the, the world is so interconnected nowadays. I think more families are realizing that it's it's a really good idea for their kids to learn another language and to become global citizens um, because they're realizing they can't just stay in their little bubbles in their towns. And that's not going to be super advantageous for their kids' future. Um, so there's multiple reasons. I think some of it is just lifestyle. They want more adventure. A lot of them are realizing that, um, you know, the, the cost of living has become so high in the U.S. and in other, you know, very developed countries. And they're realizing that they can uh, travel the world with their family and spend less per month than they do back home. And of course you have to either rent out your house or sell it and not have that mortgage while you're traveling. Um, but there are, it's, it could be so much more economical to um, travel abroad and take advantage of geographic arbitrage, you know, earn in dollars, pounds or euros, and then spend in lira, bot, pesos, what have you. So, um, there are so many reasons. And I, on my Facebook profile, I have a gigantic pro con list of why people world school. And it's not just my reasons. I, I queried lots of people and had polls up. And so I have a bunch of information there. If you just go to my profile and look for it. Um, so yeah, I would think either they're disenchanted with the education system or, and they want more for their kids. They want their kids to actually be prepared for the future. And they feel the traditional schools, whether public or private, they're not really, um, you know, offering that to their kids. And they want just more adventure with their um, family. They want a better cost of living. They want uh, to spend more time with their kids. I mean, in this modern lifestyle, you know, with parents going to the office, during, you know, going through that commute and the kids going to school, they, with all the after school activities, you hardly see um, your kids. And so world school parents tend to um, be able to spend more time with their kids. Um, I mean, you don't have to all the time. You can enroll in schools in other countries and hire nannies too, if you have to work. But um, they also are realizing they don't have to work so much. They don't have to earn so much money because it can be more economical to live this lifestyle. So multiple, multiple reasons. I think people are just kind of fed up with the rat race and um, just being on that hamster wheel and they just want a better life. You're, you're describing me to a T. So all, <laughs> all of that resonates, as I think you know. Um, a lot of the things that you're describing to me also sound like philosophical in nature or, or almost like a lifestyle. Do you find that the families, I mean, I know this is kind of still an emergent trend. You've been at it for some time. 
Um, but really, I think COVID kicked off like another wave of all of this, especially when many parents were then able to work remotely, but then also parents were like school kind of became unbundled, right? Parents got to, it wasn't just this place that you sent them to where there was education and there were friends and everything else. And it was like, okay, kids were at home during part of the lockdown and things like that. And then parents also got kind of a firsthand look at the actual education and what was going on. And, and like, Hey, if, as you said, if they're just sitting here on a computer doing zoom, we can do that anywhere. And, and, and also if you're, if you are sitting on a computer doing zoom, like, Who's to say that whoever, you know, the local county hired to teach calculus is actually the best person in the world to teach calculus? Exactly. Why not just find the person in the world who's best at explaining it? So yeah. for and all I those reasons. I want to point out that mm -hmm. uh, the public school system and even the private schools, they didn't know how to do Zoom school. They, they did a very poor job because they're used to standing up at, with a blackboard or a whiteboard and doing it in person. So there mm -hmm. are online schools out there that are very progressive and innovative, and they do a much better job teaching online. Um, whether it's an online class or a whole online program, they do a much better job at engaging the kids and interacting with them and not just lecturing at them. So, yep. so given all of that, I know this is somewhat of a recent phenomenon, but do you find that like the families who are going down this path are, are like, you know, planning to world school long-term, like this is, this is the route that they're taking mm -hmm. for the rest of their children's education, or is it more like, I've heard the term like a family gap year or something like that. Yeah, all of the above. Um, again, some people are doing it for years and years. Some people like what we did, we said, we'll try it for a year and see how it goes. And then I have my kids vote, you know, if they want to keep going. And so far it's been seven years. Um, others do plan a gap year. Maybe they have jobs where they can't take, you know, they can't take their jobs on the road and they've saved up money. Maybe they've rented their house out for that year and they're doing a gap year. And those families tend to spend a lot more money uh, because mm -hmm. they're trying to do everything on their bucket list. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have people, again, they just go on school vacations during the summer, which is much more expensive. That's when everyone else is traveling or, you know, spring break, winter break, whatever. The, again, I still consider them world schooling as long as they're tra um, treating it um, as a travel experience and a world schooling, to, you know, to learn, not just a vacation, not just to have fun and go to a res resort. So, um, yeah, I think all sorts of families do it. Some families, they say they want to wait until their kids are older so they can um, remember, but I, I don't really think that makes sense because it's not about what the kids remember. It's about um, the experiences they have and who they become, you know, a global citizen and much more aware of the world and empathetic of other people and cultures and understanding of, you know, the world and not uh, beyond their little bubble that they typically have. And it's also a great time for kids to learn a new language. Very, they just soak it up like a sponge. And then others, um, will say, oh, well, my kids want to return when it's high school time because, you know, they should have the same high school experience that I had doing sports and going to prom and, and all of that. And, you know, there was a, a prom in Normandy, France at a, a castle last spring for world schoolers. So we can create proms too, you know, um, and kids, world school kids do sports around the world. That's a little difficult to do like team sports. Um, but, you know, every family has their own rhyme or reason of how long to do it, when to do it, the age of their kids. Um, you know, and, and for my kids, we uh, we did it for six years straight. They kept voting yes. Then one of my daughters, I have um, twins or fraternal twins. She has ADHD. And so she was uh, kind of getting a little frustrated with certain things about traveling, like waking up early to catch a flight. And she really missed my mother, who's basically been a co-parent since they were born. And my mom had a temporary, you know, f fell down, hurt herself. So Aubrey wanted to go home and spend the summer with grandma. And while she did that, Gabby and I went to Argentina and she was working on improving her Spanish. And so then Aubrey decided she wanted to try school. And, you know, she was 13 at the time and, you know, teenagers and whatnot. So um, the school near my mother was terrible. Um, so I, cause she bought a house in a school district that didn't have a good school cause she wasn't thinking that we would be there. Um, anyway, so Aubrey did decide uh, to try school. I found that I was able to transfer her to a better school. It's a Montessori, still a public school. And uh, we just have to drive her 20 minutes each way. So she's done that while Gabby and I now fly back and forth. 
part time. So, and we are hoping in the future, Aubrey, because she's now getting disenchanted with school and the social <laughs> scene there. And she's realizing, mommy, you're right. They're making us do a lot of silly, busy work. And, you know, with her ADHD, she struggles with certain classes with, that she doesn't have any interest in, uh, where she's interested in other things, you know, and we can still do those other things while traveling. It doesn't have to be within the four walls of the school. So I am hoping, again, I'm trying to let her make the decision. I am hoping that she will vote to start traveling again in the not too distant future. <laughs> so there's all different ways to do it. So, yeah, uh, there's so many interesting bits to that in your, in your own story. I want to come back to your story, but something you mentioned that just kind of like got me thinking, and it's something I, I think about often, and that is this idea of like, how much will they remember it and what age is the right one to start? My girls are three years and a bit and three months. And when I think myself, like, I mean, some people are different. Like my sister has lots of memories from, from fairly early on, but like, I would be hard pressed to come up with more than a memory or two from before I don't know, five years old. But at the same time, it's, it's almost impossible for me to think that like my daughter, who's three now, who, you know, we have so many experiences every day, there's different stuff going on that she Maybe, maybe, you know, when she's my age, she won't necessarily recall each one of those in detail, but that those experiences aren't actively shaping her life. Um, it's impossible for me to think that like, you know, the day-to-day -day routines that we have now are not like exactly what are forming who she is. I mean, you mentioned language. So we live in Spain. She's learning. I mean, she knows more Spanish than I do at this point, in addition to English and Russian. And so it's like, yeah, <laughs> the idea of, of, you know, is it only worth it if they remember the very specific things or are you just creating a, an environment, creating the best possible environment as a parent, you know, to raise your children in regardless of the specific memories that is. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, you know, when you read stories to them when they're really little, they're, mm -hmm. probably, they're not going to remember that. But exactly. it's part of who they become. It's part of they're being exposed to words and pictures and all of that. And then eventually yep. they'll learn to read. And so being exposed to different cultures and traveling and food and smells and going to these busy markets and different languages. I mean, that's that's still part of who they become. And yep. um, let's not, not discount, you know, the parents' memories. I mean, it's it's your memories are worth it, too. Like playing on the beach with your baby. That's an awesome memory, you know, and it shouldn't just only be what your kids remember. It should be what we remember too. And take lots of pictures and videos because that will help them later on remember. Yeah. So that see that's the interesting thing. And this is my own sort of like projecting and uh, and fear is that, you know, I, I was, so I know some families come to this and, you know, they've done the whole traditional school thing and then they decide this world schooling is interesting, all the reasons that we talked about, and they decide that then they want to go on this adventure. In my case, it's a little bit the opposite where I was a nomad for years. I was traveling and, and moving all around the world and living in all those different countries. And then I had kids. And then it's sort of like, how do you reconcile this? Because on the one hand, there's this lifestyle that I enjoy, but family first, I want to make sure that I'm giving my kids the best possible upbringing. And so, you know, the potential concern, I'm not saying this is a problem, but the potential concern, the thing I watch out for is to make sure I'm not just doing something that's like, you know, selfishly following my own interests at, at, at the expense of, you know, the, the ideal childhood. And so you mentioned your, your girls voting. And I wonder, like, from the families that you've gotten to know and that you've worked with, you know, is it usually the parents who are driving this and kind of dragging the kids along? Is it the kids themselves who are enjoying the experience and want to continue? Like, how does that work out? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the age of the kids. Obviously, when the kids are little, um, it's, you know, the parents um, who kind of decide. And it's just like the parents decide to stay in one town and never leave it and live this very kind of sedentary life. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that is a choice. We all have different choices as parents, whether or not to raise our kids religious or not. I mean, there's how to feed them, whether you should be vegetarian. I mean, there's so many parenting choices, right? And Tell me about uh, it. So this is one of them. It's a lifestyle. And, um, you know, most world schoolers that I know do have their kids um, have a say. Because honestly, if you don't, if you just say you do it my way, the highway, you're going to get really cranky kids and they might become anxious or depressed or, 
you know, act out. That's not mm -hmm. fun either, you know? So it, it depends on what type of parent you are. Um, but keep in mind that, you know, for millions of years, human beings were nomadic. That was the norm. And then, you know, the agrarian farming thing was invented. And that's only when they started settling in little settlements and having farms and towns and cities. But for millions and millions of years, it was normal for us to be nomadic. Obviously, we would gr uh, travel together in a, in a group. Um, and people are doing that now with world schooling. Um, so this is not an unnatural thing for a human being to do. Um, it's just for, you know, uh, thousands of years. And we've grown up in a situation where we grew up and went to school. I mean, unless you moved around a lot, but a lot of times most people stayed in their same town and maybe would travel 50, 100 miles from their town and never go anywhere except for maybe once in a while to Las Vegas or Mexico or wherever. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's totally fine. It's the age of the internet and uh, cheaper airlines. And think about, you know, back in the day, people, the aristocrats um, in England, for example, would go on their um, big voyage. I forget the grand, the great the great tour the grand tours the grand tour. yeah. exactly they do the grand tours down through france and germany and italy and and greece and sometimes with a tutor if they you know were wealthy enough to have them and so it was mostly wealthy men but eventually women started going too and so that that's been happening for a while and this is basically a cheaper way to do it the whole family can go you don't have to go on a stagecoach or a large you know slow moving ship there are more affordable airlines nowadays and parents can learn on online. Some kids learn online or in person, you know, uh, around the world. So it's just available. And, um, you know, my kids, we go often to world school hubs and sometimes the same ones over and over. Like every winter, we've been going to a hub in Bansko, Bulgaria, and I've become friends with the, the, um, the organizer, a Dutch woman. And she has a big group of teens that are at that hub every winter. And my daughter, Gabby, she, this is, we're going on our third winter in a row and we're going to see the same families. And some of these families we later see in Greece, or we've seen them in Italy and we've seen them in Mexico. So we do um, keep in touch with a lot of these families. And again, we didn't go to that prom in France um, the last spring, but we're hoping to in the future. And um, it's just a nomadic lifestyle and we keep in touch online. You know, my, I'm keeping in touch online with Messenger usually or WhatsApp. My daughter keeps in touch with her friends on Instagram or um, Discord and they chat and, and keep up to date with each other. And that's kind of our new, no new normal. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'm getting so many ideas as we as we speak. So we we talked briefly about age and you know the the kind of different starting ages and some of the benefits of maybe even starting early. Is there a particular age that you recommend starting? What makes the ideal kind of like profile of uh, you know a, a family that's in a good place to to take this leap? Um, you know, I, any age, as long as they're healthy to travel. I, I know, uh, I know a mom. She gave birth in three different countries, and they were world schooling and traveling the whole time. I mean, like you, they started out as a digital nomad family, and then they gave birth here, and then two years later, another baby, and then two years later, another baby in a different country. So, um, you know, they recommend uh, newborns not to go outside much, or I mean, they need to have their shots or whatever. So, you know, maybe wait till they're three, four, five months old. <laughs> I mean, really, it, it, you yeah. have to take more gear with the baby of, you know, where they're going to sleep and sit in the car seat and all of that um, and strollers. But, um, you know, they there's babies all over the world. You can buy na diapers, nappies all over the world. There's pediatricians all over the world. You can get, you know, health insurance and travel insurance to make sure everyone stays healthy. And so, um, so yeah, I, again, most people do it uh, when their kids are I would say preschool age and up. I do think sometimes it's a little tricky with toddlers to, to travel fast, especially because toddlers, you know, tend to run. <laughs> they, they kind of will escape your hand. And uh, toddlers are just a handful. When my twins were toddlers, I called them twinados. And one was a runner. <laughs> and we would lose her at the mall <laughs> or at, oh God. at Target. Yeah. So um, the toddlers, depending on your kids, you know, um, maybe that's when you want to live somewhere for a while or get a digital nomad visa or, or whatever, just slow travel. 
Mm -hmm. I would I would suggest that uh, maybe hire a nanny, go to Bali, go to Mexico, go somewhere, Colombia, and get a nanny to help um, keep them. I, I again, most people are very safe, but I've heard a couple bad things of toddlers falling into swimming pools, you know, that didn't have a gate around them. So you need to baby proof. You need to make sure, um, and this is why you should be in a in a safe place for your when they start walking, you know, and yeah. um, make sure they don't fall down or fall into water, you know, things like that. That's the only concern I would have is to make sure you're in a baby proof space. Um, you know, so that's the only concern I would have other than that, than any age, really. I have left a trail of those little plastic uh, outlet covers in Airbnbs yeah. around the world at this point from like number of Airbnbs that we've stayed at where I'm like baby proofing all the outlets when we check in. Yeah. And that there's just, I don't know, hundreds of those things wherever we've been. But yes, I, I can totally relate to that. How about in, in your own personal experience? What was the catalyst for you and your family to, to start your world schooling journey? Yeah, well, I, before I had kids, I had traveled a lot. Um, I backpacked around the world in 98, 99 as a young woman. And I always took trips, you know, uh, abroad, uh, mostly when I was working and had my two weeks of vacation time uh, working for a company. And so um, I had my twins in 2016 in New York City. We did move back to the Seattle area to be closer to my parents. I crazily launched this indoor children's play cafe um, north of Seattle. It was like 8,600 square feet, about 800 square meters. It was in, uh, an insane business. And I was working 100 hours a week at first, then 90, then 80. It was too much because uh, we had birthday parties on the weekends. So I had to work on the weekends. I had a preschool there, not just a play cafe, but a preschool and three birthday party rooms. It was nuts. So I Plus launched twins. it. <laughs> yeah, plus my twins. And my mom was bringing my twins because I'd, of course, wake up early and go to the open up the store. And I had staff, I mean, up to 14 employees. But then I would be when the customers would leave and my mom would take my kids home, I would be there till midnight doing the books and the marketing and schedule it for the next week for my employees and dealing with the legal stuff. I mean, there's as a business owner, you have to deal with all that. So I burned out, I put it up for sale and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And I always thought in the back of my head when my kids are teens, we'll do a gap year, right? Um, we'll, we'll, maybe they'll study abroad somewhere and I'll go with them. But I, um, I heard about a family that had sold everything and backpacked or traveled around the world for a year. And they were giving a talk in downtown Seattle that Thursday. So I, I, stopped what I was doing and I went. And so this is, I guess, in 2014 <laughs> that I went to it. And so they showed a slideshow and they told me about these Facebook groups. I didn't even know about the word world schooling just yet, um, but they had this families traveling, kind of a small group that I joined. And then I just dove into the rabbit hole and I realized, yeah, I can become a digital nomad. I started following some digital nomads and then I heard about world schooling. And at the time, you know, there weren't a lot of um, content creators, influencers, but course creators, whatever. They had a little bit of, you know, blog and YouTube videos going on. So I was just researching it all and joined every Facebook group that I could uh, on this subject. Um, and so that's what I decided to do. And I said to my girls, I said, girls, we hardly had any vacation time because mommy was working all the time. We went to California. California once for 10 days and went to Disneyland. But other than that, we never traveled. So I said, mommy's going to sell my business and let's go travel for a year. Now I did want my girls to learn Spanish, but I wasn't as fam familiar with Latin America. Um, I was a little bit, but I kind of knew Asia because I traveled a lot in Asia. And I actually was born in Korea. My mom's Korean. I lived there for a while. So, um, you know, so I said, okay, we'll go to Asia. My kids are into nature and animals. And that's what we did. And I thought we'll try it for a year. And then during that year, I didn't work because we were uh, traveling on the proceeds of my business sale, but I, I spent a lot of time in Chiang Mai, Thailand and, you know, really tried to um, learn more about uh, various digital nomad jobs and businesses. And I've tried ne many different things over the years. I've sold products on Amazon. That was a disaster. I did sales and marketing consulting. I, um, yeah, <laughs> Amazon was a, a brutal. I taught English online, which was kind of fun, except for waking up in the middle of the night. And then I helped launch an online global school and I helped run it for a few years. So um, lots of different things. And along the way, you know, and I also co-hosted a homeschooling uh, summit. Along the way, I was learning so much about education and the way my kids were learning. And they attended a school in Peru for a while and then one in Mexico. And we tried, you know, nannies and online schools and all these different ways. And then I met in person, hundreds of other families, and I would uh, learn from them. I always ask, what do you do for a living? Because you know, the main questions are, you know, how do you fund it? 
how do you travel like logistically and planning and lifestyle and how do your kids learn? So those are the mm -hmm. three main questions. Um, so yeah, this is, that was kind of my start. And then I kind of evolved and, you know, I think because I've worked in alternative education and I know a bit about it, I really wanted to help people with that option. And so my course, I don't teach people how to fund the lifestyle. I have a big list of uh, jobs and businesses that you know I can share. And I may someday collaborate with somebody who can handle that part, but I help with all the travel logistics, you know, the practicalities, the uh, lifestyle and doing it in a nice way where you're not gonna burn out and you're not gonna make costly newbie mistakes. And then we go into the different ways to educate kids. And I always talk about pros and cons of different ways. I don't try, I don't want to push my way um, because every kid is different and every family is different. So I always just show the options in detail and then people can pick and choose. And um, yeah, so that's how I kind of evolved to having my course. I, I'm running it, um, I've run it twice and I'm just starting with the third one. And it's awesome. I have like, I don't Know, 14, 15 people this time around. We just had a Zoom meeting. So every Thursday we meet um, for an hour on Zoom and we have a couple different times because I have people in Australia and people in Europe and a bunch of people in North America. Um, so we alternate the times that we meet. Um, but yeah, this is when people can ask me questions and then everyone can meet with each other and be in community and because we're all you know, on the path together. So that's kind of how I evolved from being, you know, starting to travel and then being a digital nomad and a world schooling mom. And now I teach it. <laughs> so I started this conversation thinking it was a bit more simple, but now I see that there are so many kind of different ways you can do this. Uh, but as you said, one of the first questions that I think most parents will have is okay, but you know, you know, sounds great. If this is, if you're the type of person who fits the profile we talked about, you're hearing this and you're thinking, this sounds amazing. I can have my cake and eat it too, right? I can have a family. I can take care of my kids. I can spend more time with them and travel the world and potentially live in places that are cheaper, maybe have a nanny. Like there's, there's a lot of upside, but I, you know, the thing that that's going to be in a lot of people's head and it's in mine is okay, but what about education? How do I ensure that I'm setting my kids up for later in life, right? That if they're going to want to go to a high school later on, or if they want to go to university or just, you know, to learn all these important skills that then carry them forward in life. You mentioned at, at the, uh, at the beginning, quite a few options from local schools to online schools to something more informal, like a combination of unschooling or homeschooling. Maybe the children are just kind of directing the learning. Do you, do you recommend any of those? Do you see that some are more uh, common among the families that you work with or how are parents educating their kids? Like I said, I don't like to push one way. Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan of homeschooling, but then um, again, my, my daughter, Aubrey with ADHD, she doesn't do as well as her twin with self-directing her learning. So um, in the future, I probably, and she wants to keep up on certain subjects and I will probably mm -hmm. sit down with her and help her do that. Um, we, they are taking a marine science class with um, a company I'm collaborating with and they love it. And it's just one teacher and the two of them every Wednesday and they they even dissected a squid like via Zoom with their teacher. So, um, but uh, again, she's going to that Montessori Middle School right now. Um, I, you know, the last week in my course, I um, talk about the future of world schoolers, uh, about how they can get into university or go back to high school if they choose. There are um, obviously you may know that certain countries homeschooling is legal, and other countries it is not, or it's in the gray area. So there are umbrella schools. Um, I like the one called West River Academy. They been around since the 90s. They have students, I think, uh, in about 150 countries. And so um, you can enroll your kids with them. It's not a lot of money. They basically take where, what your kids are learning and put it on their transcripts and they put it in the language, you know, that makes sense for schools. Now they are a California, um, they're accredited and they're based in California. And again, they don't have a curriculum, but they take what your kids are learning and it's a accredited transcript. Eventually it will lead to a U.S. high school to 
diploma, which is recognized in all countries where homeschooling is legal and a lot of gray area ones. So that is one way um, kids can enroll in an online community college in the U.S. for when they're 16. And you don't have to be American. You do have to pay if you're not American. Um, there's so many options. You could take the SATs. You can just take uh, tests. There's so many ways. Um, and then again, a lot of people feel that universities are becoming um, obsolete because they no longer have a monopoly on knowledge. And people, you know, schools don't teach entrepreneurship. I mean, they're teaching this very antiquated curriculum, and they're not teaching entrepreneurship and critical thinking and all the things that the world needs. We need entrepreneurs and inventors and creators and problem solvers and healers, and we need that. We don't need more Wall Street guys. Sorry for those watching who work on Wall Street. Um, and homeschoolers, unschoolers, and world schoolers, they do trade in crypto and they invest in money. I'm not saying they never do that. Um, there are capitalists among us, okay? Um, but I, I would say that if you keep your kids in the traditional school system, you are hurting their chances for their future. And if you do it, especially the world schooling way, because universities in the US love homeschoolers and they especially love world schoolers because that's, that's a homeschooler or unschooler with an international experience. Um, so I believe that world schooling is probably the best way kids can learn and be ready for the future because not only are there many, many ways to learn about what they're interested in um, and they're not being force fed this common curriculum to basically keep them average. They can soar on what they're really good at. And plus all the global experience. I know so many world schoolers who speak other languages. They've uh, launched a business being a video editor or a VA or, you know, many different things when they're 14, 15, 16 years old. And um, some world schoolers do go to top universities if they choose that, or they launch their own businesses, or they work as freelancers and they're, um, you know, digital nomads. So um, I can just say, for my kids, they're not, you know, grown yet. But um, again, I mentioned I have twins. So Aubrey chose to go to school. We're in the US right now temporarily. And just for fun, we put Gabby in there as well. And she's neurotypical. And she has not had any formal learning. I mean, she attended that online school that I worked for, but it was very self-directed, like she could pick and choose what she wanted to do. And she was kind of, she's an artist. She's um, really likes writing and uh, cartoons, right? And she didn't do any math for years and years. So she is currently taking algebra and currently getting a B and she will probably, she's working hard to learn it. And she said it's a little slower for her because she skipped math, you know, multiplication and, and all of that. And mm -hmm. she's learning it and she's acing all of her other um, things. So Very cool. again, this is a girl who didn't have any formal schooling for or any like accredited formal schooling. I just allow her to work on what she's passionate about. Um, now, unschooling for in our family, um, they can choose what they want to learn, but they um, have to do some learning on a regular basis. They can't just sit around and do nothing. Um, although they do spend a lot of time playing games, Minecraft, Roblox, I mean, in the past, and reading a lot, just that's her passion. I'm watching a lot of cartoons. And I think Gabby, she has such a, a knack for storytelling because of all the cartoons and the reading and writing that she's done. Um, so again, um, that's just my family. And I've interviewed grown world schoolers for, I have an interview series and I interviewed you for it. And I have interviewed uh, 20 something year old uh, grown world schoolers and they're amazing. They're very independent. They're mature. Um, you know, they can take care of themselves. They're pursuing either a higher education or they've already launched a business or written a book and they're on a book tour. They're quite amazing. I haven't seen a lot of world schoolers who have failed to launch. And um, I think they're also happier and they have better people skills. Um, you know, there's less bullying happening. There's less depression, and anxiety. Not that it doesn't happen at all, but there seems to be less of it. So I would say world school, if you want a, a better future for your kids. <laughs> you know, the, the thing that strikes me is that the, the, like the most important, I guess you could call it almost like a meta skill these days is being able to figure stuff out. That sort of yeah. autodidact, like, you know, take a new topic. Um, you mentioned chat GPT earlier, which I think is going to play a lot into this also, but, um, 
this is a technology that more or less didn't exist at like a useful commercial level a year ago. Yep. And that now is like quickly becoming relevant to all kinds of businesses, governments, individuals, it's all over the place. It's a hot topic. And, and like, you see that there are people who very quickly within a few days of it, you know, going public, we're figuring out, you know, how to make a business based on it or how to do their old job faster with it and all of that. Right. And then you have all these other people who who look at all this new technology and say, oh God, it's going to put me out of a job or, you know, this is going to result in lots of layoffs. And the the difference is the people who feel like whatever comes out, they can figure it out. They can hop on it. They can learn the new thing. And the people who feel threatened by that. Right. So I, I I agree that, you know, different I mean, we, we've all seen it. If you've been a student, you've seen that, you know, someone got the lesson immediately. Someone needed to go home. Someone did better with video. Someone did better with a book. Like we all have our own learning styles. Uh, but the, that ability to learn, that ability to constantly yeah. like face a new topic and figure out a way to to learn it, I think is yeah. actually and the my most girls have that. Gabby is complaining that in school, in her classes, when she has to do group projects, she's the one doing the work. She's the one who wants to learn it. And the other kids are burned out. There's a famous uh, TED Talk, the most watched TED Talk ever by Sir Ken Robinson, that says, does uh, school kill creativity? And mm -hmm. you should watch that. I also think it zaps motivation because when you're pushed the whole time to learn what the teachers or the school district wants you to learn, I mean, again, antiquated stuff. I mean, my daughter, she can't use Wikipedia and she has a uh, computer from her school, but it won't allow Wikipedia. Like as soon as you get a job, they're going to let you use Wikipedia yeah. and they're going to let you use a calculator. And, you know, get, uh, Aubrey, and again, my kids are artists, so they don't like um, artificial intelligence because they feel like, oh, we can't be an artist. It's going to steal our work. But, you know, Aubrey uh, did not do well in language arts with her ADHD. She just can't sit down and write a big, long thing. And so she that was one class she did not do well in last year. And so she was feeling bad about it. And then I opened up ChatGPT to her and I just said, honey, you're probably not going to grow up to be an author or a journalist. So if you ever have to, you know, I started typing. Um, create a presentation for your new business, for your investors. ChatGPT can write it for you right? I mean, you have Grammarly now, you have tools there. Um, and I'm a big believer in having your kids soar with their strengths and either outsource the other things or, you know, use technology to, to, to do that. And this is what our future is. This is in the work world, we do this, but in the school system, they don't let you Google things that much. I mean, they, they have very controlled uh, websites that you can visit um, on a school mm -hmm. computer. So um, yeah, I think the people who it's not about what you know right now. It's about um, can you figure things out? Do you know how to learn? You know, yep. a huge percentage of our kids' future jobs haven't been invented yet. So, you know, when that new thing comes, are they going to be the type that wait for a teacher or a trainer or a boss to teach them? Or are they going to be able to jump in and figure it out themselves? Those are the people, the ones who can learn quickly. And, and again, it doesn't mean your IQ has to be high or low, but they have their that muscle in their brain. They're used to doing it. They're used to solving problems. They're the ones who are going to be successful and be able to um, do well in that the new the future. I could not agree more. So, given all of that, and we're and we're we, you know we're circling around this kind of AI topic, and I think we're going to see lots more online education and AI tutors and things like that coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are already doing this with ChatGPT for their kids. I have a friend who decided to homeschool his kids uh, in another country, and he just like co-wrote the curriculum with ChatGPT. Right? He just pulled yeah. in a bunch of different resources. He said, "Okay, this is all the stuff that I want to have them learn." Um, yeah. So, as you know, the the tools are getting built out as we speak. That I mean, let's let's face it. Like twenty years ago, if you wanted to homeschool, you were mailing away for some books or something like that, and you were, you know, as you said, following the curriculum of some other school, and just trying to do it yourself at home. And now you can play to your strengths, pull on all those different threads as a kid, self-directed. You know, go on YouTube. You can find every lecture on any topic that you want. So all, all of that exists, and what we're saying together that, that that's what the world also rewards is, is people who are able to do that stuff. Yeah. So given all of that, do you see that world schooling is going to sort of take off? Are we on the cusp of this going mainstream or is this just too weird that it's always just going to be for some, you know, select number of people who right. just, you know, want to live this lifestyle? 
Yeah, I mean, to that AI as a tutor point, I did interview Serge Hunt, who I used to work with at that online school, and he launched a new one called City as a School, and they ha it's online, but he they have some classes in London and uh, Brooklyn, New York, um, but he just launched a, a new AI tool. It's a tutor, and, you know, it's on their website where you can go and um, ask, uh, you know, say to the AI, hey, I want to be a mechanical engineer. What do I need to learn? And it'll tell you, and not only it'll tell you what to learn and where the resources are all the links, but you can check in with it regularly and it will kind of give you a day by day or week by week curriculum or what or task list of what to do. And it will kind of be your online learning coach or tutor. Mm -hmm. So that's already happening. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, again, I don't want to force people who don't want to live this lifestyle, who are happy to, you know, be homebodies and stay and they have no interest in other cultures. Uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to force people to do this. I, I am an advocate of this lifestyle because I see the advantages um, for my family and many, many other families that I've seen around, I've met around the world. So I do think it's, it's going to be taking off more, just like being a digital nomad takes off. And again, it doesn't have to be forever and you don't have to world school or work as a digital nomad the same way all the time. This Everything can evolve, things can change. Again, like one way to learn might work for your kids when they're younger, and then when they become teenagers, you try a different way. But <clears throat> there's so many options there. You know, for the course, my the participants of my course, I put together a list of over 700 online learning apps. Many of them are free or low cost. And then, you know, a big list of online schools, and I have it, you know, um, also information if they're traditional versus progressive, if they're synchronous versus asynchronous, and what age it's from, it's for, and then local schools around the world, I have a list of 100. And, you know, I have, there's, the reason why I have these resources is because there's so much now out there, and more are company, coming, and more World School Hubs are popping up, and those are a great place to go, not just to learn, but also to connect with other like-minded families. So I do see that this is growing, and this is why I got into the World School business to teach others how to do it, because it is scary. And I do um, see a lot of people make newbie mistakes, and some are minor, and some are really big, and they cost a lot of money, or somebody gets hurt. And so um, I'm trying to uh, teach people to do it a, the, a nice way, so they can live a nice lifestyle and sustain it and not lose a lot of money or get ripped off or, you know, be robbed or, you know, other things that can happen in this lifestyle. So um, it is daunting to some, especially people who have not traveled before, or I have actually people who have joined my course who've traveled to 40 countries and lived abroad, but they um, still learn a lot of travel tips from me and obviously like the ways to um, educate their kids. So um, it's, a, it's a lot. And this is why I have 12 of a 12 week, 12 week course. And it's about 50 hours of content that I produce every cohort, um, like 20 plus hours of, is my training. And then I interview, you know, people like you and the online school people. And then we have our weekly Zoom meetings. It's a, it's a lot, but um, I record it all so you can watch it if you miss it and you can have access to it forever. And I share my Google slides and it's about 500 slides. Wow. It's, I basically wrote a book, but I, it's in Google slide form. <laughs> I'll make sure we, we link to all of that. Uh, just before we wrap up, uh, just a few more questions. You mentioned getting hurt. Um, just to give listeners some context, I'm the co-founder of Genki. As you know, we've spoken before about health and health insurance for, for digital nomads and world schooling families um, and the options that we offer. How do you feel this lifestyle affects your family's like physical and mental well-being is it it does does being a world schooler take a toll does it enhance your your health where does how, how do you feel that these come together well, it, it, I mean, like any lifestyle, if you're having to work a lot and figure a lot of things out, it can be stressful. Um, I try to encourage people to slow travel and because I think when you fast travel, it can be really stressful. And then that's when everyone starts getting cranky. Um, and, you yeah. know, the, the we do have some health issues, not major, but um, my daughter and I, we both have thyroid issues. And so, um, she, you know, for she had a flare up and uh, we... Um, it, it was a pre-existing condition. So I did have to pay out of pocket for that when we were in Mexico. And then we were in the Republic of Georgia and I bought local insurance 
there, but it didn't kick in for six months. So I had to pay out of pocket there. Um, so, you know, I, I am able to get healthcare around the world. Um, you know, she fell down and, and hurt herself and had to get stitches down here. So once in a while things happen. Um, but I, I think I'm, we're happier. Um, if you do it the nice way, you know, slow travel, if you make sure to make friends and if you make sure to make time for yourself as a parent. And that's why it's really nice to be able to be in a lower cost of living country where you can hire a nanny once in a while so you can get a break to work or have a me day or a date night or go to a, get a massage. You know, um, I think it's better for everyone's mental health. And nowadays, you know, you can have online mental health. Um, again, I don't know if that's covered under Genki, but there are options for telehealth. Um, it, mm -hmm. it is a little tricky because certain doctors and therapists are licensed in certain parts of the world and you need to physically be there. But there are um, options for just online paying out of pocket. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, um, you know, whether we're in the US or traveling, it's still possible to get healthcare. And, um, you know, you just need to uh, kind of design your life. And I tried to create, uh, say, you know, lifestyle optimization. <laughs> so you're being able to, you know, spend more time with your family, have more joy in your life, not be so stressed out, not have to work so much because, um, if you're living in a lower cost of living country or traveling to them, um, you don't have to make a hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever you need in a big city in the, in the States or Australia or the UK or wherever you come from. And, um, that helps with mental health. I also think, um, you know, when you leave your country, you get less sucked into the drama and the political divisions. And so you, true. you still, I still watch the news and try to keep up with it, but it doesn't like, really hurt hurt me as much as when I was there getting really frustrated. I'm a big, I'm really frustrated with the gun situation in the States and how many school children have been killed and how our politicians don't do anything about it. So we feel safer. I mean, when we're abroad, even in Mexico or in Medellin, Colombia, I don't have to worry about my kids getting shot. <laughs> You know, and obviously we choose we choose countries and places and neighborhoods that are safe, um, but that really helps with my stress. That dovetails nicely into the actually one of the last couple of questions I wanted to ask you, which is: Are there any uh, particular favorite destinations you have as a world schooler? You know, traveling as a family with the kids, and any in particular that you'd recommend for families who are getting started. Um, yeah, I do have a, a post. I, ha I don't have a blog yet, but I do post on my Facebook profile a lot. So people are welcome to send me a friend request or they're just public posts. And if you don't have kids or anything in your picture, I might not accept your friend request. So send me a message and let me know why. Um, and I, I'm, I'm fine to be friends with digital nomads without kids. I have given talks to nomad conferences about becoming a digital nomad, you know, and, and, or, being a digital nomad with kids. Um, so I have a, about a toast, sorry, I have a post about the top five uh, countries for world school newbies. And if I can remember correctly, I have Thailand, Indonesia, specifically Bali, um, Mexico, Spain, and I think Costa Rica. <clears throat> and all these people, all these places have pretty good tourist infrastructure. English is spoken in those areas. Um, you know, it's easy to get around. There's fun activities to do, um, fairly uh, low cost of living, although Costa Rica is getting pretty expensive nowadays. And there, there's just a nice way to go for a trial run, I think. So if you can go for a week or a month or, or longer, um, those are places that I would recommend. Um, we have been in all those places and, and also uh, we spent time, again, every winter we go to Bonsko, Bulgaria. There's an awesome hub there. Um, we've been to Turkey and um, we like that. There was Fethiye Turkey when we were there, because things change all the time, there was a big group. Some of these places are seasonal, like there's certain times of the year to go to Chiang Mai, Thailand, or Bali where there's there's less rain, you know? So we mm -hmm. really look at the weather and we look at where people um, like to gather. And um, yeah, I mean, we've spent quite a bit of time in Europe and Latin America and Asia. Um, my kids have not been to Africa yet, but we're hoping to make it to Morocco and other places. Um, we still haven't been, I've been to Australia, but they haven't yet. So um, yeah, so we're just, continuing to go around the world. And we really look at um, trying to find other uh, families, especially teens, because my kids mm -hmm. don't want to travel with just me. That's boring. <laughs> 
You mentioned uh, world schooling hubs a couple of times. What What is a world schooling hub? Yeah, so there's different kinds. Some of them are really organized where they offer um, either uh, lots of activities usually. And like the one in, in Bonsco, they have activities for uh, teens, uh, school age kids, and then even little ones. And they have a staff there to, to manage it. And then also for the parents. And then um, they offer accommodations. Some places do not. Um, they kind of, you can sign up on a month to month basis during the winter. And some have a full on school, like Boundless Life um, has four locations so far. Um, they're a little, little bit more on the higher end. And then the Hive in the Dominican Republic has a self-directed learning center and they do really cool projects. I think a six-week um, sign up that you can do and um, something to do with a UN uh, sustainability project. So um, so they might have a school, they might not, they might offer accommodations or you have to find your own. Um, so those are organized ones. And then you have, um, again, pop-ups, they could be for a week and there's everyone's just going around. Uh, a woman named Rachel Carlson has worldschoolpopuphub.com and they're week-long um, meetups around the world. And she she's not even the one who does them all because um, other families can sign up to be a host and organize a week in Tokyo or a week in you know wherever. And then you can advertise on her platform. Um, so you have the pop-ups and then you have more casual organic hubs. And that's just where people gather. You know, like Chiang Mai is a, a, hub, a digital nomad hub. It's also kind of an a organic world school hub. I mean, a lot of places where digital nomads go, um, some some places world schoolers want to go to. So, you know, Bali, Playa del Carmen, um, Buenos Aires. Well, Buenos Aires is not as much for world schoolers. We've spent time there. Um, but La Jaradura in Spain and Andalusia, mm -hmm. that's a casual hub. There was a woman who organized things. They had activities going on, but then she left during COVID. And so all these families that had moved there at least part of the year, they kind of picked up and started, you know, they created a WhatsApp, you know, group where they would post, okay, we're going here today. We're hiring a teacher who wants to participate. So those are more like cooperative, casual, organic hubs and you just pay the fee for whatever activity or class there is. Um, and the other ones have very, you know, organized things where you pay them tens or um, hundreds or thousands of dollars per month to participate. But I like to do those once in a while. I like to do both. But as a busy uh, working sing single mom, I don't have time to be super involved with all the organizing of the activities. And so I sometimes would just pay someone and I know my kids are going to be with a group of um, other teens and, you know, there's safety around. So, um, so yeah, there's just many different kinds and they're awesome. And um, I'm actually, um, a lot of them come and go um, because some world schooling parents usually will launch one and they'll, they won't anticipate how difficult they are to run. And, you know, it's kind of like the hospitality business and some of mm -hmm. them burn out and they decide to stop. So I, I know a bunch of world school hub organizers and in the future, hopefully in 2024, we're going to collaborate on a course for people who want to launch a world school hub. Um, and, you know, I will just be the moderator and they'll help me with all the course content because we want really great, good hubs to exist so our families can go. You know, we want them to be sustainable and not have owners who launch them on a whim and then burn out and never do them again. So um, that is coming in the future. I think World School Hubs are awesome, whether they're casual or organized, and they're all different. They all have their own rules and their own policy. So they might may not all fit your family. You really have to find out about them. And some of them are really expensive and others are very economical. So you just need to find the ones that work for you. Fantastic. I have learned a ton. Um, so f for all those of us who are listening, watching, and think this sounds like an amazing lifestyle. Sounds like the you know most obvious next step, connect with you on Facebook, uh, sign up for the course. Is there anything else that you would recommend um, or in terms of just like next steps or getting started for people who are interested in, in either just learning more or actively pursuing this lifestyle? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I gave you guys a, a web or a, a URL that you can post maybe, and mm -hmm. you can go to my website and I have on there, you can get some free resources, like a list of 200 plus income ideas to fund the lifestyle. Again, I don't, I'm not a digital nomad career coach, but I offer that list for free. And then I have a video on the top six ways to educate your kids to world school. Then that's another freebie. I have a free masterclass on how to launch into a lifestyle, kind of how to begin. And that's kind of the beginning of my course course. And then I obviously have information about my course. I also have a Facebook group where that's where I stream my uh, weekly interviews with folks like you, other world schooling families. There's about 50 video replays up there now. And I eventually get them on my YouTube channel, Trailblazing Families. I think you could just search for that. So, um, but I do stream usually Tuesdays and Wednesdays when I interview another world schooling family or a, a service provider, a guest expert about different topics. And so definitely join my Facebook group. Um, it's called World Schooling Traveling um, Digital Nomad Trailblazing Families. It's a long, I tried to get the keywords in there. We'll link to it. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, those are, again, you can just check out the content that I have and uh, tons of videos, um, lots of posts. And then, um, you know, check out the free resources. And if you want to be fully prepared and launch into this lifestyle with more, you know, knowledge, less stress, more ease and more confidence, then I have a super comprehensive. I mean, this is not a baby course. It's not an introduction. It's like a super mega course. And the nice thing is, um, I mean, as of this recording for the first year and a half of doing the course, you can be a member for life. So you can keep coming to my Thursday um meetups are my Zooms um, and ask me questions. So um, I'll be there to hopefully support everyone um, as they launch into this lifestyle. Fantastic, Liz. Thank you so much for sharing all of this and for all that you do. As I said, I'm, I'll make sure that we link to everything so everyone can find all of that. And thanks again for joining. Thank you. It was awesome to talk with you again, Neville. Thanks. My pleasure.